Hello, in this lecture we're going to talk about the production possibility model, trade and globalization, chapter 2. We're going to start off with a quote from Adam Smith, who is the father of economics. And he says that no one ever say, saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. And I believe what we're getting at at this point is that the thing, one of the things that differentiates uh, people from animals is the ability to negotiate, the ability to uh, trade and by trading and negotiating, we tend to be able to be better off, both of us, through that mutual agreement, through that trade. So it's worth something worth taking a look at, something worth looking into. So we have the chapter goals, which are going to be to demonstrate trade-offs with a production possibility curve. We're going to relate the concepts of comparative advantage and efficiency to the production policy, uh, possibility curve. And state how, through competitive advantage and trade, countries can consume beyond their individual production possibilities, which is very nice. Explain how globalization is guided by the law of price. All right, so we're going to start with the production possibility model. So, of course, we will be looking at a model here. And when we look at a model, remember that what we're doing is taking, uh, you know, a piece of the economy, a piece of the world, and trying to concentrate that down into a mental model that we can apply reason to within a mental model and then see if that that reason can apply to the bigger picture so we'll take a, a look at a couple different kind of variations within uh, this model note that when I used to think about models when I first started looking at economics I used to think well this is going to be a simplified model and then later on we're going to you know look at bigger and these large models that will basically be the entire world and I just want to point out that's not really the case. It's not like we're going to do a simplified model because we're not advanced enough. Really, that's not the only reason because we're not advanced enough to do uh, more complex models. There are more complex models, but I just want to point out that we're always going to use models in economics because you, you can't apply things with all factors involved because things get very complicated. So oftentimes, these simple models are simple not because uh, they're going to be an introduction possibly to a more complex model but because we can actually derive the most information from a simplistic model because it allows us to isolate factors so here's one of the the uh, principal models that we will be looking at when we think about economics so the production possibility models can be presented both in a table and a graph a production possibility table is a table that lists the trade-offs between two choices so in this case, uh, we're going to have two choices that we're going to list out in the table, and we're going to and we're just going to limit them to these two choices, and we're going to plot out um, the output. And output is a result of an activity, and plot out the input is what you put in uh, a production process to achieve the output. So we're going to put something in, like time or something, and we're going to get something out, whatever we're producing or making or trying to achieve. That is the output of putting in our time. So a production possibility table could look like this. We have a very nice uh, Excel sheet here, of course. And no, we're not talking about money here. And, and again, I, you know, uh, we could measure things in many other ways that, that are just not always uh, money would be our only measurement. It's not our only measurement when we think about economics. So in this case, we have our choice for a student to study either history or economics. So the only things we're going to be uh, considering we have decided that there are a maximum of 20 hours to study between history and economics. And the question is, well, how much time should we spend on history and how much time should we spend on economics? In order to uh, determine that, then we might want to think about, well, uh, how much, if I spend this amount of time, what will the resulting grade be? What will the output be? If we put in the input, what will the output be? Obviously, this is an estimate because we don't really know what the output's put is going to be until the output happens because it's going to happen in the future but we're going to have to if we think about it you know if we try to estimate it then we can come up with some kind of table like this in this case we're going to say well if i put uh, 20 hours in history then we think we can get a 98 and if we put that same 20 hours in economics we can we think we can get 100 percent which actually indicates that economics with this one data point is easier than than uh, history which which i don't i don't think is true you might want to put more time in the econ club but in any case we're just going to use the data point and then we're going to go to the second data point and that means uh in in the history if we put in the 18 and and note if we go back up here if we put 20 hours in the history that of course means we're putting no time in economics 
And we still think we're going to pull a 40%, even if that happens, because it's like multiple choice questions on the test. So we might be able to pull. And then if we get 18 in the history, we think we're going to get a 94. And that means we only have two left over for economics, which we're going to boost us up from the 40 to the 46. And then if we only put 10 in history, we think we're going to get a 78. And if we put the same 10, the other 10 of the 20 into the economics, we believe we can get a 70. If we put four in history, we think we're going to get the 66. And that leaves us 16 for economics, which would put us at the 88 and so on. Now, if we don't put any time in history, we still think we can pull out a, a, a 58 because, you know, we've watched the history channel and whatnot. So and then and then we got the 20 in here. And also you might be thinking, well, you know, I can think about economic history and then combine the two. But we're, you know, we're, we're keeping them separate, history separate from uh, the economics here. All right. So then if we go on, we're going to say, what is the output? Of course, the output would be the grade in this case. What would be the input? The input would be the time that we are spending in each of these areas. So the production possibility model then, a production possibility curve, the PPC, is a curve measuring the maximum combination of outputs that can be obtained from a given number of inputs. So it gives you a visual picture of the trade-offs embedded in uh, a decision. So obviously we can take that table we just made and graph it, which will be great, which we'll see shortly. A production possibility uh, curve is created from the production possibility table by mapping the table in a two-dimensional graph. So here is a two-dimensional graph. And we, if we just map two points, and if it was a straight line as this is, then uh, we can map the two data points and draw the straight line through it, and that should be good. So if we look at that then, for example, we had, remember we had the 10 hours in each. We think we're going to get a 70 in econ and a 78 in history if we do that. And remember we had, if we said we're going to put 16 in econ and then 4 into the history, we think we're going to get an 88 in the econ and a 66 in the history. So obviously this axis being the econ axis and this axis being the history axis, we have our straight line. That's our production possibility frontier. So a production possibility, I mean, <laughs> our production possibility curve. So um, there's, there's a limit to what you can achieve given existing uh, 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 institutions, resources, and technology. Every choice you make has an opportunity cost. So in this case, we can produce basically at any point on this curve. And th those are our production possibilities given the 20 hours that we are applying. And then, of course, we have to decide what is going to be our, our optimal output. Notice we can't we cannot pr produce anywhere outside of this line unless we put more time in or come up with some other resource that would improve our, our production. And if we produce anywhere within this line, that means we're putting less than 20 hours or we're not being efficient within our time. Anywhere on the line means that we are efficient. However, uh, we still need to decide which point on the line which would be most beneficial to us.